Icewind Dale, sending the Yeti to boarding school and other stories. Through a contrived series of events I won't recount, I wind up on a 5th edition Spelljammer server, which also happened to be the stomping grounds of a certain green text YouTuber, and started running an increasingly homebrewed Icewind Deal campaign there. This is the ongoing story of a band of savage cannibals trying to pretend to be heroes, and a GM trying to make sense of it all. Here's where the story goes nuts. I mean, I think we're succeeding in looking like the heroes, even though we're clearly not. <laughs> we put on a good show. This is the almost all goblinoid party's best bits, chapters 19 to 12. Be me, GM, loving this train wreck. Be not me. Avar, the human enchantment wizard, semi-accidentally commits mass murder. That's James. Yep. Elton John, the goblin celestial chain warlock, worshipper of the horny one. Nettie El Yeti, the bugbear arctic druid, post-ironic frost maiden worshipper. And simp extraordinaire. <laughs> to be fair, he hasn't simped in a long time, so oh. maybe, possibly not. Orc, the half-orc zealot barbarian, still pissed on everything. Look, it's not a session if he doesn't piss on at least one thing. Stugok, bugbear assassin rogue, with a big iron on his hip. <laughs> I'm going to do this because every time he gets a really annoyed with me, so like, yeah, that's that's just that uh, that's just that Spanish fell with the trash audio. <laughs> <laughs> he absolutely fucking hates when I say that. <laughs> Right, okay, guys, I'm going to shut up for this one because Megan doesn't know what happens yeah. in it. If Megan asks me something, then I'll respond. But for that, I'm going to remain silent throughout. Yeah. So let's get into this. In Soviet Russia, <laughs> you probe aliens. <laughs> With their business in the northern towns sorted, they set out towards the crash spelljammer, past the southern towns, across the tundra's dunes, and into the mountains. They stuck to the valleys and Avar's isle helped them swiftly locate the downed craft. It was like the shell of a colossal snail, with slimy tentacles like the front. Stugok stayed by the sled, well away from the ship. On their approach, the party got jumped by a gooey, many-legged centipede-like monstrosities, which took a chunk out of a few party members before they got taken down. Forcing open the ship's door, they came into a cargo bay and encountered a trio of diminutive, floating creatures with mouth tentacles almost to the ground, and their guardian, a humanoid stitchwork of meat. Orc lunged at the monster, digging his great axe into the shoulder. It didn't move. It didn't flinch. It headbutted the barbarian to the ground and punted him into the storage crate, spilling alien tech all over the floor. As the party was shitting its collective pants, and the squidlings were laughing their tentacles off, a tiny gooey voice called off the golem, a mind flare, an extremely short mind flare with a bad head injury, which waved its arms around and carried a little box in its hand. The box was chirping steadily, faster and faster as it approached the party. The party settled down, as it seemed non-hostile at the moment. It spoke, but none of the party could understand it, until it was reducing to miming. It seemed especially interested in Avar. So the wizard decided to hypnotise it. No problem. It's going to make it safe. Rolls dice. Fuck. He initiated his rhythmic Mongolian throat singing. Your Mongolian throat singing? Yeah, so that's what I use with uh, hypnotic hypnotic gaze, I think it is. So what I do, do is... Role play? I, yeah, of course. You've got to role play that shit. <laughs> so, so, you know, example. so what you do is you just go up to them. I like to imagine I put my hands on their shoulders and you start going... Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> You know, something along those lines. I, th I think it works, you know? The tiny aberration gradually nodded off and fell under his control. They searched the mind flare, taking the clicking box, which intensified as Avar grabbed it, and even more as he held it closer to the Psy crystal. Plus a strange weapon. It resembled a hand crossbow, but there was nowhere to put a bolt. Similar weapons, resembling full crossbows, were recovered from the broken storage crate. The party declared this as a victory and promptly fucked off, running away from the ship and the terrifying creatures within. The dazed, naked flare could do little but watch them run. Yeah, we did strip them down, by the way. You just left them naked, no, cold. Cause, yeah, because the, the thing... tundra. Yeah, okay, because, okay, so what happened was we were a bit worried, we couldn't really work out a way how to deal with them and we didn't want to really get into combat per se so we thought right okay maybe we expose him to the elements and maybe his cock falls off 
that would be a great way to kill someone and not actively kill someone. And because you like, never mind, guys. Like it was, it, it was an idea. We tried it. It didn't work. Just when the party thought it was clear, the snow nearby moved, and a bullet leapt into the group. They tried to run, but it was no use. It downed a couple of them, and it looked to be a TPK, until Stugok rushed in, slaying the monster with well-placed crits. Seriously. Yeah, of, oh yeah, of course, Stugok, okay, I'm just saying, he was away having his fucking dinner at the time, like, oh guys, I'll be back in a few minutes, I'm just like, we're all dying here, it's like, Stugok, help! Help! <laughs> to be fair, he did go in, and like, it was like three crits back to back, it was actually really fucking stupid. Pretty cool though, pretty cool to watch. Seriously, how does this happen every session? On their dash back to civilization, the party stopped to examine the weapons they'd stolen. Ned and Eivar, the resident brains, almost blew their feet off with energy blasts. <laughs> then Stugok tried his hand with it, threw some switches, and blew a hole in the carn in ten places. So, look, well, we, would we, you we, look at that? <laughs> look, look, we got a we got a big iron. We got a laser gun. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> Hey guys, so are you looking to spice up your game night? Do you need some orcs to raid your camp? Do you need some illithids to suck out your brains? Do you need some undead to rise from the graves? What about a dragon to slap down in the table and fuck up your players with? Or if you prefer a frost giant or a manticore, we got him. It's a lot more fun than dropping rocks in your players' heads. Or maybe you just want short stacks. Because we know you love them. We have such an expansive range of fantasy options and we're currently trying to expand into not 40k. (laughs) Also, if models isn't your thing, go check out our subclasses. There's loads of stuff there that you might find interesting. But go ahead and check it out. Links are all down below and let's get back into the video. The Minithids strike back. The party settled back in Bryn Shander with the mummy outside the walls and Ned's igloo watching over the Yeti. A proper inn stay for the first time in a week. Still, they were awake well into the night, discussing and planning, especially about what to do with Dazan once they saw him again. As they were about to head to sleep, a knock came from the door. Stugok opened it and saw the mummy. They asked why it was here. Give us the crystal. That wasn't normal. Inside the mummy's mouth, Stugok saw a rat. It glowed with a soft blue light and its scalp had been cut away to show its brains. More rats appeared from the stairs, from the corners, from the rafters, all glowing softly. A whole swarm. It repeated its demand, but Ivar played dumb. It served the Mind Flayers, who were already here, right next door in fact. Next door was the innkeeper's room. Time to fight. Stugok succeeded in freeing the mummy from her domination, but not before both were severely damaged. Orc did his best to crush the psychic rats, but axes aren't the best tools for dealing with swarms. Avar and Elton John opened the window and jumped onto the roof. Elton John dropped to the street, running for reinforcements from the gates, and saw the flesh golem in his way. Several unconscious guards slung over its shoulder like sacks of grain. He figured the next best plan was to run through the street shouting, Monster! Monster! Once the swarm was dealt with, Orc, Stugok and Ned rushed downstairs. Snow blew in from the open door. They rushed up to the innkeeper's room, with Stugok invisible. They find him lying dead. Two gnome-sized mind flares on either side, their tentacles dripping with brain fluid. They were hit with a psychic scream, stunning them. Stugok fell unconscious on the stairs, still invisible and slowly bleeding from the ears. Ned was held at laser point, and one of the mind flares spoke into his mind, insulting and reprimanding him for his behaviour on the ship when his companions had tried to be friendly. Now they had to come and take the side crystal they needed to repair the ship, and some prisoners for good measure. Ned held up his hands and tried his best to be diplomatic, all while Avar spied from the window. Stugok was an invisible tripping hazard, Orc was waiting for his moment, and Elton John was waking up the whole time. While the mind flares nudged Ned down the steps, Orc lunged forward in ambush. Avar summoned a python and threw it across the window, while Ned brought his fellow bugbearer from the brink of death. Lasers and psychic screams tore up the room. Orc was joined by the spirit of an orc chieftain, and the action economy did its work. One mind flare fell, and the other was wrapped in the python's coils. That was when Avar jumped into the room, pressed the side crystal to the illithid's forehead, and then slammed his own head into it. 
He saw stars, actual stars. He was lost in an internal void. Was this how a psychic connection felt? Then he sensed the brain. Its psionic presence was colossal. He had tried to create a psychic link with the Mind Flare, but it wound up going directly to the elder brain it served. Even brushing against the surface of its cognition threatened to engulf him. So Avar gave it his best salesman pitch. Well, of course. <laughs> I don't know how this must look, but we did do you a favour, so we did. <laughs> you don't want to have your will being done by those kinds of servants. Honestly, they're a bit trash. <laughs> hey, but you do us a favour and we help you out. Sound like a deal? Eh? Right? What about that? I mean, like, look, if servants are trash, we kick the fuck out of them. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Obviously, this elder brain, as far as a wizard concerned, a wizard who is very interested in accumulating knowledge <laughs> and working a deal with an elder brain sounds like the best way of gaining information. <laughs> you know, just saying. The brain responds by stripping his mind down to its base components, undoing his ego and rationalizations, his identity, all going the way down to this very essence. It compared its values to his, and Avar experienced a psychic handshake. You're hired. The wizard rocketed back to his body, now staring into the eyes of an impotent mind flare abandoned by its creator. To everyone else, the whole experience looked like it had a seizure for a few seconds. Kill it. Orc took its head clean off. By that point, Elton John had riled up a huge crowd, including the sheriff, who was hopping forward with his pants half on. The party met him in the crowd at the door, showed them the remains of the mind flares and told them all to stay back. They would handle the golem. They unleashed their flashiest magics while Orc and Stugok went in for round two with the monster, finally bringing it down. These things are tough to dispose of, they told the sheriff. We'll take it out of the city and do this properly. Of course, with the aid of the elder brain, they had gained limited authority over the golem. It had made a big show on fallen to the ground without hurting the party, or being hurt much at all. It set out for the ship, and the party prepared to fulfil its end of the bargain. Best use of prestidigitation ever. <laughs> we were like sitting shitting fireballs and be like, choo, choo, choo. like do you know, do like a big show and stuff. It was <laughs> like actually a Disney show. Yeah, 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 it was. And it's like, oh yeah, we got him, you know what I mean? Like made us look great, we sold our soul. Like, I got a level in Warlock, great old one, just saying. <laughs> Solid deal, boys. They were celebrated in Bryn Shander, the heroes of the city, and with the death of its owner, the North Look got torn apart by revelers. Stugok winded up stealing old Bidey the magic fish for himself. When the dust cleared and they actually got a chance to sleep, the new heroes of Bryn Shander nobly set out to ensure the aberrations left the deal for good, wave off by an adoring crowd. It was half true, at least. On the return to the ship, they met with the Squidlings, which now regarded Avar and the Giant Slayers as colleagues of a sort. They took the Psy Crystal, which would serve as a backup power source to repair the ship, which would take a week. The party explored the inside of the ship, unhindered, and picked up some useful loot from their stories. Interlude. The Lottery. They returned to Bryn Shander as victorious heroes on the eve of the Lottery. Ned was at the head of the crowd, driving a naked dwarf into the blizzard that night, to be sacrificed to the Frost Maiden. The whole town heard screams and saw strange lights that night. Nobody said anything, chilling with a cold one. Newly enriched and admired, the party had a laundry list of objectives out in the tundra, which they decided to complete in one expedition. First to meet with the Frost Giant Sage, Jelavukin, and learn the cause of the Everlasting Rhyme. The days passed peacefully enough as they journeyed far to the west. They found their destination, a tall hill ridged by the colossal stone thrones of the ancient frost giant Jarls. Meditating at the centre of the ring was the giant sage, stripped to the waist and perfectly content in the cold. He sensed the party's approach, and Ned made instructions. The giant allowed all members of the party Ned trusted to be present, which turned out to be everyone but Orc. Who left the piss on some snow? <laughs> yeah, Orc. Uh, Orc likes to fight big things. And, oh, yeah, that's uh, th not bring him. And, th and this would be a perfect opportunity of for him to fight a big thing. Yeah, yeah, that's not. It picked Ned up by the scruff of his neck and set the bugbear on his lap. Elton John Lynn jumped <laughs> into Ned's lap while Ivar sat nearby and Stugok hid behind the throne. The giant pulled a handful of herbs from his pouch and rolled them up daintily. 
This is the good kush, he said, lit the joint and healed deeply and passed it around. Then it told the party what it had learnt. The eternal winter started at the same time that Arul's daughter, the Emperor Nalkara, disappeared, apparently slain by adventurers invading the Undermountains. Soon after, he heard a horrible scream of anguish from Arul, and then silence. Even he, one of Arul's most devoted followers, had not heard a single word from his goddess in two years. The winter was Arul's mourning and desire for isolation. It was unlike her to mourn, yet this was all he had gathered. Ned was devastated to learn that all the signs he thought were from the Frost Maiden were really coincidence. The party strategized, wondering how she might be broken out of her gloom. Stugok put forward his theory that the Frost Maiden just needed a good leg. <laughs> <laughs> the giant then got the munchies and swallowed the Perton carcasses the party had brought him and invited them to return in the full moon. What shall we bring you, wise one? Snacks. Of course, oh wise one. And the largest herring in the realm. It shall be done. Mmm. Shrubbery. How do you- it, was, it wasn't until that point that I realised, wait, he's quoting Monty Python at me. <laughs> <laughs> took, me it took me a while to yeah. catch on to that. It's yeah. been that long, you know. How the Yeti went to boarding school. The next destination was a wreck of the Dark Duchess. A ship run aground on ice which might have some rum they could sell back to Bryn Chander. They found an ice troll in the cargo bay, which they demolished. Did I mention bugbear assassins with laser guns are broken? <laughs> <laughs> the troll was after a trio of kobolds, which surrendered when they saw a naked half-orc eat an ice troll's heart whole. They told the party that the ship was used as a hoarding site by the white dragon Arvia Churis, and she might be back from hunting any minute. The party immediately got to melting the magical ice pile to get to the treasure within. I was here for this session. I remember listening yeah, to you quite came, a lot of this yeah, session. Yeah, you just came home yeah. had, I think, at the end of this. Meanwhile, Elton John absconded to the upper deck. He knew exactly where this was going and reached the captain's quarters. He looted the remains of his former captain, including a swanky hat. The process of melting the ice was slow going, and the goblin decided not to be around when the dragon returned, taking the sleds and all the animals half a mile out from the ship and burying himself up to the neck in snow as camouflage. He did say to us, like, guys, come on, let's go. Yeah. But, but, we did see some pretty... We've seen some shinies. We saw some shiny some shinies, yes. You know, and we weren't going to let that shinies get away from us. Yeah. A few hours of waiting later, he heard the beating of heavy wings and saw a colossal white dragon flying straight for the ship. Back in the ship, the party was recovering layer after layer of treasure. By far their biggest haul since they arrived in the deal. They had just revealed the bottom of the hoard, which included a creepy-looking wand, when the timbers of the ship trembled above them. Stugok was on lookout. The dragon was ancient. It could have plucked a whale out of the sea. In a saddle rode a black-cloaked figure. The dragon should have seen him immediately, but it didn't. The dragon was so old it had cataracts. The party was scrambling to hide. Ned had shifted into goat form to pass himself off as the kobold's next meal. Stugok was holding the kobold at sore point to keep them quiet. Orc sliced open the ice troll's corpse and hid inside its guts. Where were you? I, I cast invisibility on myself oh, and I just hugged onto the a goat. <laughs> no, I hugged on to Nettie to get a quick getaway so he could like, come like fuck. I was just holding on as tightly as I could with invisibility on. The dragon sniffed about through the hold and saw its hoard was all but gone. As it raged, Avar had a bright idea. With the power of the Elder Brain, he spoke directly into its mind. Pretending to be an extra planar being, he told it that the people of Dugan's Hole, a rundown inbred town they had saved from Winter Wolves, had stolen the treasure. Oh, and their leader was a jackass wizard named Dazan that lived in <laughs> East Haven. <laughs> of course, his check succeeded. The dragon swore vengeance and flew off to annihilate the town. Elton John saw it fly away and said a little prayer to his patron for his dead friends. Much to his surprise, they showed up a while later loaded with loot. The party needed to get out of Dodge fast. Luckily for them, the Illithid ship had just finished repairs. Avar summoned the Spelljammer, which picked them, their treasure, and their caravan up with its tentacles. Then they were off, flying through the blizzard and away from the deal. It dropped them off near the port city of Luskin and prepared to leave the atmosphere and return to the far realms. Well, it didn't drop all of them off. 
The party wasn't confident in their parenting abilities, especially dealing with an aggressive yeti cub, which they had permanently traumatised, so they sent it off to boarding school, to the Far Realms Institute for the Psionically <laughs> Challenged. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, we sent they it all- off to live with mine first. <laughs> yeah, you fucking did. They all figured it would return one day as a cyber yeti to murder them all. And they were fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> They're now back in civilization with money to spare, but their story must continue in the deal. A story of false heroism, of massacre goblins, and being posted. <laughs> <laughs> but that must wait for another day. <laughs> so look, guys, was it really that evil? Did we take a turn? I did set up a deal with... I did take a level in Warlock. I did convince an, an ancient dragon to murder a town full of inbred swine. Now, to be fair, these inbred people were not very kind to us. James, and not we did... lie. You sound pretty fucking evil, man. Look, it's evil by convenience sake. <laughs> All right? It's not actually evil. It was just... And the thing was... It's only know... evil if it doesn't benefit you. Well, you know the thing is, okay, so in-game, because I was, to- I was talking through my head, uh-huh. no one else knew, knew what, what you were saying. Knew what was going on. I just said, yeah, I mean, I just give them the slip, you know? <laughs> So it took a while for uh, the rest of them to catch on. But look, you guys will find out in the near future, I think, worked out for the best. (laughs) Just saying, you know. Well, if this is something you like, let us know down below. And we'll definitely keep doing them because they're still playing the game. Yeah, we're still still active in it. And while you're down there, check out the links to the models. Check out the subclasses, the t-shirts, all that good shit. Hit subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get notified every time we post. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye. Thank you.